Well, we'll get right into it. At what point did you and Billy realize that the NWA was an option? Uh, Billy had actually spoken to uh, Bruce Tharp, I think, while we were at TNA. I know they had at least one discussion before um, before we made the overture in, I think, February or March of this past year. Um, the option or the idea was actually brought to us by Dave Marquez. He's like, hey, you know, have you guys thought about the NWA? Because he knew we were uh, – I hate to use the word struggling, but I, I dare you, Sean, to start a wrestling promotion and come up with a name for it right now off the top of your head. Do you know what I mean? Like uh, branding a wrestling promotion is very difficult. So when there's obviously one that everybody has some sort of recognition on, it was obviously a very, um, very easy thing to chase down and obviously uh, valuable especially valuable to us because we knew what we wanted to do with it. It's funny you mentioned Dave Marquez. Actually, I spoke to Colt Cabana recently, and I'm, I'm going to tie that in a little bit to a piece I'm working on. But he mentioned how you and Dave Marquez had worked together for a long time, including you being around when Colt was trying to bring a little more prestige back to that NWA title around the seven levels of hate deal. So, I mean, this isn't exactly your first go around of, of being around like the NWA and uh, being around Dave Marquez having a hand in making this NWA championship mean more than what it did in the months prior. Yeah, uh, it's sort of like the forgotten part of my history, which is fine. Uh, after I left WWE, I actually took a, about nine months off from wrestling. I didn't do anything in wrestling for nine months. I don't think I did any interviews. I don't. This was actually pre-Twitter, uh, so it's just you kind of vanished back then. So. You know, Dave reached out to me on Facebook in 2008, said, hey, we're doing these tapings at Columbia Square Studios uh, on Sunset Boulevard, right across the street from Sunset Gower and Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles, for anybody that knows the area, and uh, said, hey, come on out. And that's where I met Adam Pierce for the first time. I met Brian Danielson. I had met him when I was at WWE. He had the Young Bucks on this show and had Caden Murdoch, who I'd worked with at WWE, and there was a... Uh, it's actually on YouTube if you search for it. And, you know, I got to know Adam really well at those tapings. And I, I did, we started working with the NWA then. And I think Championship from Wrestling from Hollywood started in 09 or 2010. I don't remember exactly when they started to do the tapings uh, of the show that's still now on the air uh, from KDOC. But uh, yeah, I've known Dave. I mean, I've known Dave all the way back to uh, a little known angle that people may or may not remember the juniors. Do you remember the juniors on SmackDown? I do. Uh, yeah, Dave was actually uh, – I hate to use the word handler because it makes you picture like cages and stuff. But Dave was sort of the uh, <laughs> like he's liaison. Up. Yeah, he was the liaison for the group, uh, and that's when I first met him. I remember we were at the Orlando taping that during that period, and Fit Finley had hit one of the juniors with his shillelagh, and the, he was the, – the junior, not Fit, was shaking uncontrollably, selling it. And I remember Vince was like, why is he shaking? And uh, Jerry Briscoe uh, – and the ref was like, basically like he doesn't speak English, so Jerry Briscoe saying no shaky into the microphone to tell the ref, which I guess was uh, how they were speaking to him. But, yeah, I've known Dave probably 12 years. So, yeah, it's – you know, and, and the Cabana time, you know, interesting enough as, as we're putting out these videos, when Cabana won the NWA world title um, – the idea was to get the title change up as quickly as possible. So I remember I shot it with my flip cam. People remember those uh, those fun devices. And um, uh, I rushed home, uh, and I quickly edited a piece together. I think we had it up within six hours after it happened, again, pre-Twitter video. And we tried to make the – I don't remember how viral it went. I just know it did a lot of views because we thought it was important when the title changed in Los Angeles and it was big for Cabana. And you know, I, I was not involved in the politics of that regime of the NWA, and I just remember our, all the headaches and discussions with Pierce and Cabana and everything that went on, and it kind of made me sad because I had a large affinity for the NWA all the way back to Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair uh, in the 80s. So it always seemed like – that's what the NWA was, a lot of politics and, and not even in politics of the guys who were in the ring. It was a lot of promoters and stuff. So that was sort of the first thing we looked at and went, does this help us? And I think the answer uh, is showing in sort of the, the direction we've taken the company. That was uh, something I was going to ask you. Is that something that you kind of bring up to Billy and say, hey, I had a little bit of firsthand experience in at least seeing what was going on here with, with the politics of it? That's something we'll have to battle uh, what kind of resistance did you all did you all experience in that? Because 
I mean, I've, I've heard some things about about how it, they're an old mentality, almost to a carny level, with some of the remaining NWA members that that kind of aren't around anymore. Yeah, the um, you know, I I, I spoke uh, literally. I think when we I think we announced that Billy was buying it in May. I went to work the next day, basically, and I called every one of them. I'd made myself available to all of them. Basically, anytime they called, I answered. Anytime. You know what I mean? Like, because they had paid a license fee to Bruce Tharp. We didn't get any of that license fee, but, you know, I wanted them to obviously all have an opportunity to feel a part of this process and, and see what, what was there. See who was professional, who wasn't, who was exactly what you said, a carny. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, were there a lot of those. And it's no disrespect to them. It's how they, it's how they've survived and ran their wrestling business. Uh, but we, we explained to them and said, listen, if you're patient and you know want to work with us, we, we were going to start running a lot sooner. And just a lot of the politics came up. You know, I don't know if you remember, like we had a trademark issue with Bruce, and like it didn't close right away. And we just decided, you know what, we're going to let it run out. We're, we're obviously going to get it. And we were going to wait till October 1st, and I think it was better that we did. You know, we had we had storyline plans. We had talked to talent. We were going to do very similar to what we were doing now. We were going to just start sooner, but we, we wanted to wait till October. And then uh, we knew the timing of Billy's solo album was going to come out in October. So we felt, why not, while he's out there already, use that as opposed to, oh, yeah, remember three months ago when we started this thing? We thought it all sort of worked in synergy. I mean, yeah, I'm seeing – Billy Corgan on the Joe Rogan experience and things like yep. that, which, you know, he could get on the Joe Rogan experience anytime he wanted. But when he's got something of this magnitude, especially an NWA championship match, that you can kind of tie into that. And a lot of it's Google SEO. They type in Billy Corgan. They, they might get NWA. They might get Tim Storm. They might get yeah. Nick Aldis and things like that as well. I had heard all kinds of stuff like about issues like with getting some people who were involved – well, they became not involved because they had outrageous demands or they made things difficult. What kind of hurdles did you all face there? Uh, I'm trying to think the best way to describe this. I, eventually, we're going to put out a documentary about exactly that period. Um, I have a lot of it recorded, actually. Uh, and, and people were aware we were recording, just, just so you know. Um, <laughs> we, we had guys who didn't want to return belts. Um, again, we're very communicative. Hey guys, we purchased this stuff. You are holding the property of of Lightning One, which was the LLC that purchased, you know, the NWA and these assets. Just letting you know, at any time, if I want to recall these, it's in my legal right. And uh, had to give a few people a uh, a legal lesson, uh, which was fine, you know. And, and but again, I was communicative of what was going to happen. And then when and they're like, oh yeah, no problem, yeah, we understand. And then when when the phone call came and the, and, and Gave them plenty of opportunity and basically said, listen, these titles are going into suspended animation. We're not stripping you. They're just they're just going to sit somewhere. And that offended them highly. And, you know, it's I'm sorry that, that they were offended, but we bought the brand and had a vision for it. And we didn't want rogue champions touring around because it would have been distracting for what we knew we were going to do, and that was always to focus on the world title because it honestly is the most valuable of the titles. Nobody is worried about the, the North American title. They're not. You know what I mean? It, it's important to the guy that held it because he got booked because of it, but it, it just it didn't it didn't help grow anything. But yeah, there was a lot of stuff. I mean, Tim talked about promoters who offered him a lot of money to do a switch against our approval. Um, it was. It's weird, and you know, I was just at the ECW arena, and Shane Douglas was there, and you know, we asked Shane if he wanted to appear on a ten pounds of gold, and he declined. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like he was angry about it; he just said no, thank you. So it's fine, you know. There's a lot of history around that belt, and sort of the the energy that goes around it, and it's you know between the Pierce Cabana Chic story, and then the Tharp stuff. It's just there's an amazing story here, and that's why we're we're telling it, and. You know, I've taken it as a very personal journey to, to establish a series that allows you to know the history of that belt. And we've told only – I mean we've only scratched a, 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 a tiny bit of the, of the surface of the history. You know, and the fact that you know, the next question everyone asks is, well, you don't own any libraries. Well, actually, we have the license on the Houston Library. You know, we have access to the Marquez Library, and we're working to get access to other stuff. 
And in reality, the I don't need full matches to tell our history. I just need I need fresh interviews with people and perspectives. I'd love to interview Shane Douglas. Maybe one day we'll get to do that. Um, you know, He's I'd love the to interview. Person so far, who has not returned my request for an interview about this piece. Oh well, uh, and, and by the way, it's Shane's story. And he, again, it was super. He was not. He was. He just said, I'm, "At this time, I'm going to decline." I, he, it's not like he said, "Give me a bunch of money and I'll do it." He was. He was again super yeah. cool. We were. We were. We were. You know, I'm friends with Tommy. You know, he respects Billy. I think he just wants to see what happens. I think he. I think he thinks it could be great for him. I. I, I respected it. We're going to put up a slide that he declined to appear. Uh, in the episode, because it's it's the number one question, you know, like like what did you do something with Shane? And he was there, and and it, it, like, that's what I mean. There's so much great stuff, and and I love podcasts. I think they're great. You and I'll talk for 45 minutes, but there's so many of them. So yeah. the ability to create something, you know, the, the episode that's going up today is five minutes, and it's it's not a heavy story episode, but it's a vibe thing. Like what was it like? The leading up to the that day to the leading up to the first NWA title match that Billy Corgan promoted, it's just it's 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 a piece of history that you don't got to wait a whole year like the Kevin Owens documentary, which I haven't watched yet, to see it. It's it's literally it happened a week ago. It's out a week later. I would have loved to have had it out two days later. It's just uh, my schedule didn't allow it, and a lot of what the company is is solely on the, my shoulders right now, which is fine. It's how we like it. You know, Billy's handling his music stuff and is available every day, and we talk every day about everything. He approves every cut that we do. You know, he's involved in every step of the process, you know, but the company's just him and I. And we have a few other support people who are helping. I actually had my first guest director do the, the ECW Arena episode, and we're, we're expanding, but we want to scale it once the product's right. It's easy to trust somebody when you're trusting yourself. Like, yeah. that's, that's the way I've always seen it, too. It's easy to trust the process when you know it's yourself doing it and your vision is coming out. The 10 pounds of gold is something I really want to talk about. Sure. I, you know, every so often before Billy and yourself got involved in the NWA, I'd occasionally hit that NWA Wikipedia page. Who's the champion? Mm -hmm. Who's the champion? Yep. Only way I could find out. Well, uh, last year I see that it's 50 something year old Tim Storm. And I say, well, that's suspicious. That's odd. Like, how does that happen? And occasionally I'll post a tweet, and I'd be like, Tim Storm, world champion, odd. And, you know, when a new regime comes in, you almost expect, like, how are they going to get the title off of him? Didn't know about him, didn't care about him. I watched 10 Pounds of Gold, mm -hmm. and that changed. Like, I saw so much about him. In WWE, so often I, I say that the stakes are taken out of things because it's like Vince McMahon wants his characters – to be portrayed as if they are above being concerned about money. Like, that can't be a concern for them. They're larger than life. Like, why would they even be worried about money? Tim Storm's a school teacher, and we see that. Like, that 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 is a concern for him. He's got to go to work every day. And then mm -hmm. on the weekends, he turns around, and he finds something that means just as much to him. Yep. Like, at what point of this Tim, of knowing Tim Storm... Did you think, okay, this is a story that we can tell, and this is something that we can grab people with? Because had you told me one year ago that Magnus from TNA and Tim Storm were going to have a match, I'd say, who gives a shit? But mm -hmm. I was there for the live stream of that match, and I, I was watching it with, with great anticipation. Yeah. Um, this is a very organic process. So um, so we went out and did – I mean I remember I put up this tweet of – Tim Storm holding the belt. I don't even think we showed Tim. And I remember every tweet that was written, how much of a joke it was, Magnus. Oh, look, Magnus is Billy's guy. That's People thought I flew Tim Storm to L.A. on September 24th to beat him for the belt. People yeah. told him that. People told him that. People told Tim to hold me up for five grand. Promoters inside of the NWA and other talents said you should hold. Billy's got money. Hold him up. I called Tim. I said, "Listen, Tim. So if if you want five grand, tell me now." I said, "You're not gonna." He goes, "Can I get that?" And like, and like, again, that's Tim's dryness. And I was like, uh, "No, okay, no, I, I wouldn't. I would never ask for it." He has such respect for the NWA. It was this one phone call I had with him because we had unbooked Tim from an NWA show, and and this shitstorm happened. I, I, all these guys are like. 
Like they thought we were going to screw Tim over, and they didn't care about Tim. They just I, – I still don't, to this day don't understand it. And I'd say about 30 hours of my week was spent dealing with the, the childish of these people who uh, – they didn't think it or they thought it was real. I, I still to this moment don't understand why, except they wanted a voice of, of something, and they didn't put their money in. Not that we needed their money, but I offered – my phone was open. Hey, call me with ideas. Hey, let's do this. Nine times out of ten, it was always self-serving to them and did nothing for the brand. The, the promoter that offered Bill, uh, sorry, Tim a lot of money said, basically, come over. We'll, we'll do a – he never told me that he wanted to do a switch. He told other people that I said it was okay. And I was like uh, – and I called him. I said, did, I, did we discuss this? No, no. I said, then why did you tell other people we discussed it? I don't know what you're saying. I said, I've – had three different people tell me that you said it was all right. I said, you're a liar. I said, and I don't do business with a liar. And I said, I said, We're, it would make no sense for us to do this in the first week about what we have plans. Well, then you're not an alliance and this is that. I said, great. I said, you're not even a member. I don't even know why we're talking about this. And that's what I mean. These people have this weird thing. But in that process, I learned a lot about Tim, the human being and the businessman. And he could have made a lot of money. He, he he would have probably made more in that one transaction than we'll probably pay him over six months. But he cared about the NWA, and that's what really – we really kind of – I've always loved sort of the documentary feel. So you know, I, I'm sure you saw the Galloway documentary I did, mm -hmm. and uh, I did obviously 30 documentaries with Billy in 30 days. We didn't stage any of those. We just had to let them happen, and once I sort of felt that – I wanted to see what was really there with Tim. So we, we did the first taping, and I got back, and Billy – and I didn't have a lot of time to interview the guys because we flew them in and out the same day just to save money um, to basically maximize. And, of course, Tim had to get back to the classroom the next day. you know. So it was all sort of crunched, and I didn't get the interview I wanted. So I, I, I proposed a budget to Billy. I said, hey, I said, I'd like to go to Dallas for the day. I'll fly in morning of, out the same day. And go to his classroom, interview his wife. We'll we'll meet his grandkids. We'll go work out. And I basically did the same thing with uh, Aldis. I went to his house, you know. And we all like as we were talking about what we we're going to do. All love sort of the twenty four seven feel. And and, and WWE does it. I, I think their documentaries are great. But I think you would agree they all sort of stop at a line that you wish they would go further. Yeah. And I didn't want a line. The only line I think we won't cross is the breaking of kayfabe. In, in, as, as far as in build up to a fight. Now I think a year from now, two years from now, we could look retrospectively back. But you know, as far as this series, I don't see this series breaking kayfabe. It's just it, to me, it, it hurts it. But again, we're exploring this as we go. So that's how we kind of got to this Tim story. And you know, I sent Billy the cut of the second episode about Tim, and it just, it's just they they just started to come out that way. And they were just genuine, and if it, if it made me feel something after watching it ten times editing it, I hoped somebody else would, and that's – I think you responded to it, and a bunch of people went – they really got into it. And then it just got passed around, and again, at no marketing budget. We didn't spend any money to get it around. We just shared it with people we thought would like it, and it's grown, and our YouTube channel went from zero subscribers. It just crossed 9,000 in 30 days, which I think is a success. Oh, yeah. I started to see like when I would upload one of my podcasts – uh, videos from NWA would show up in my recommended videos along the sidebar. Yep. And I thought, that's never happened before. <laughs> never, ever. In years of producing content, never seen that. Uh, never seen anybody tweet anything in regards to the NWA in a positive manner. And all of a sudden, I started to see it. And I was getting excited for this match. Two wrestlers who I've never s anticipated anything particularly that they've ever done. All due respect to Nick Aldis, he's a great dude and a great interview, too, but I've never been like, damn, can't wait for that Magnus match. I've just never felt that. But I thought he was the right guy to be there. He's young. He's accomplished. He's in great shape. He's a guy who very, like, is out there. He turned down a contract from Impact this year, so it's not yep. like people haven't wanted him. It's just he's not going to – he wants to do what he wants to do. It was the perfect story, and I thought – I really thought this is just a setup, the big heel run and establishing Nick Aldis as champion. But Tim Storm won, and we'll talk about the match a little bit, but I think everybody thought Tim Storm was going to lose. But when Tim Storm won the match, the piece that I was writing went from 
hey, I like this buildup as a, a feature of just me and my thoughts to, okay, I want to talk to a lot of different people about the NWA and the issues they faced before and some of the things they've overcame and how they got me invested in this match. What type of reaction did you get personally like from people about the choice of Tim to win the match? Uh, I think people I, – I, it was interesting is, is, you know, I think – you know, when we did when we set the angle, you know, that one day in L.A., uh, I mean, I think Meltzer even said it. Obviously, he's he's their choice because, you know, and, and he fits. You look at Nick Aldis and you look at Tim Storm and go, oh, yeah, I mean, that is the logical. And I'm not saying it's illogical what we did, but there's there's great story in everything. And, you know, as we I hate to say what the plan always was, the plan was always for Tim to win the first one, because otherwise He's a piece of shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, uh, and he's old Tim yeller. Is, he got took out back and shot. Yes, but once people started to care, it cemented our, it cemented the idea. You know what I mean? Like, and that's the good thing is, is it's, it's very fluid, it, and not Vince McMahon fluid, but it's fluid. Meaning we, we all, and, and here's the thing: we all communicate. Nick was a part of the process. Tim was a part of the process, but Tim's never been here before. Like the lines that I have Sam Shaw, who, by the way, is the narrator. I don't think people have kind of caught on. That's Sam Shaw doing the narration from TNA. I was going to say uh, the wrestler. That was, yes. That's yes. great. Yeah. So, and again, like we don't put it because, you know, we probably will end up using Sam Shaw and not that it's mm-hmm. not that it's, I'm breaking anything with it, but Sam, Sam's somebody that I've, I think is very artistic and I, and he always has a very deep voice and people think it's me, which my new voice is very nasally. Uh, and I don't think I'd be good at it. So, you know, Sam, I asked Sam, I said, will you do the first one? Yeah. And he's done everyone since, and he's been happy to do it because it expands his skill set. Everybody that's a part of this process is a part of this process. And because if we get this right, if we get this process right, as we grow, it is a very good creative environment for talents to work in. And honestly, fan feedback. You know, we I get a lot of fan feedback, and it's interesting. There's one guy that hates Tim Storm. I mean, he is – I mean, it, it's 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 a, it's a it's almost laughable. He's like, Tim Storm shouldn't be who represents your company, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, did you watch the video? Yeah, but he's 53. Okay, besides age discrimination, why don't you like him? I mean, are you dead inside? You know what I mean? Like, you do not feel what this man feels? Okay. Is Tim the greatest professional wrestler ever? No, but Tim, he is. He is. Uh, he is. He is the guy that we got. His story is exactly the story of what we bought, and then it gets to a meta level that I, I hate talking about because I think it's silly. But Tim represents what we bought. But he's. He is. He has a heart, and the brand has heart. It's not like we bought WCW. You know what I mean? A brand that people started to hate. People used to love the NWA, and now we're hoping that they'll love it again. And Tim's exactly that. You know what I mean? He's a guy that once you fall in love with, it's hard. It's hard to not feel something. You know, I think the match was the match. I don't think uh, should get stars thrown at it. But as far as your care to watch it, there there are plenty of matches that get lots of stars in pro wrestling now, right? You know, it's it's to me the fact that people cared about Nick Aldis and Tim Storm is a credit to them, not me. You know, I, I don't take any credit for it because it was simply their stories. I went to each of their homes, and they shared their story with me. What I did was simply put in an order that made you feel something on top of what they did. If they had boring lives or they just didn't have anything to say, then the story wouldn't have been good. And I didn't write any of it. And that's – it's funny is, is uh, the promoter or the guy that wanted to book the title switch and pay Tim on he's like, you're just a writer. You, you're going to fail. Said, cool. I appreciate your opinion. I'll see you on the other side of this because this and for Billy and I is a chance for us to show what everybody sort of missed out on and we're having fun doing it. And it's not sort of an F you to anybody, but we're just showing that Tim Storm versus Nick Aldis became something that 2000 people without any promotion watched on a Saturday evening or sorry, Sunday evening just because they were cared about it. That to me was a win. So I, I can tell you how my, my initial impression of Tim Storm, you hear all the politics of the NWA of old, and even as you all look to transition into what you all wanted to do, you look at it and you see 53-year-old guy, NWA world champion, how did that happen? What went into that decision? What do you know about what, what went into the decision to put the title on Tim Storm in the first place? Uh, nothing. Uh, uh, th- that sort of was... 
I know he won it from Jack Stane, who I just met for the first time. And we're actually going to see – I just finished episode six, and I'm about to start episode seven, which is sort of the fallout from Tim's match with Nick and his trip to Clarksville for his match with Josephus and sort of the the setup for the trip to Philadelphia. Um, and I met Jack Stane, very nice guy, very big guy, very wide, you know, very – like 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 super cool – I didn't want to know because that was somebody else's story. We just simply picked up I, – I, I make the equation, and actually it plays out in the Philadelphia episode, that he's Rocky if Rocky would have had the championship at the beginning of the movie. Mm -hmm. He's a complete underdog that you don't know who just happens to be the world champion. Why do I need to make up a story? It's a great story, and he looks the part. If he was a garbage wrestler who wears like baggy shorts and like a tank top and had no body and had no story, then we probably would have changed the title. But as you get to know Tim, that's that's that that was what intrigued me, not the politics of why they picked him. Tim's Tim is one of the nicest guys. He's willing to do anything to help anybody. He's not selfish, and to me, that is the most likable babyface. Think about this: if 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 WWE would have had this guy as a babyface in the Attitude Era, he'd be a heel, right? Mm -hmm. But I think this story, if if they would have told the same exact way, it, I think it would have worked. But I, I it's it's hard to say. But it's just interesting that that a pure Sure, babyface, 53 years old, has become sort of this cult hero. Like, go search Tim Storm on Twitter. It's actually one of my favorite little things to do. It's actually how Nick Gage goes, what the fuck is a Tim Storm? So I had Tim write back, hi, I'm a Tim Storm. You know, like like literally in a video. Because it's so ridiculous in a good way that this guy has it, – it should show every wrestler out there how if you simply tell your story, not just in 140 characters, but in a three-dimensional way – how amazing you can connect with an audience if you simply open yourself up. So I want to talk about the challengers that came out of this because I, I, I had never heard of Josephus. Never, yep. ever, ever. And then I watched that promo, and I was like, wow. They they got this guy. They, they did something with it. Like yeah. a guy who I looked at, and I'm like, I would be I would dismiss immediately. No thanks. Yep. Not, not interested. You made me interested. And then this weekend – Tim Storms at uh, House of Hardcore, and I see guys like Joey Janela on Twitter, who is always active on Twitter, challenging and, and doing all these things. What were some of the more surprising challenges that you saw that came out of that? Because I, I knew you all you all encouraged them. Uh, actually, we didn't. The, 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 what actually started if it, in the timeline of all this, um, and again, you were, you watched the match. And again, not a five-star classic. I think it was a very good match. I think obviously anyone with eyes would feel like it sort of, sort of petered out at the end. I think both guys would agree. Well, that's, I that's, think that's actually I'll, I'll sorry to interrupt, but that's something I did want to ask. When Tim said that he has never blown up, and then he kind of blew up a little bit, how did you feel as a producer after that? Well, what's interesting is the match story. Tim was supposed to sell the the the. What do you call it? The Kingsland Cloverleaf. Mm -hmm. So he was – I think he was half – again, I didn't ask him about it. I think he was half selling, and I think he was half blown. He had – I. Th you have to look at the environment. Tim has never had a match like that. No, like, like he's never been – and I'm not saying a physical match. He's never had the pressure of that. That is that is a – I don't know how I would have handled it. You know, he's been at a certain level, and Nick Aldis had said it in the videos, and even – I don't think he realized the different levels that came to that game. He had never had a major television match. He had done television with Matt Riviera, but one that people worldwide live were watching. And the guys didn't even realize we had streamed it until after they had came back. And they both were like, why did we stream it? I said, because people wanted to see it. And ultimately, I want everyone to feel like at any time the NWA can go live, and you're never going to know, or maybe you will. And it's to me this ability to pop to have these pop-up events – and and really, and the fact that people wanted to see Josephus and Tim Storm on a Friday night to me was was amazing. Yeah. Uh, and that's why we made that available on Instagram Live. And I remember people going, "Well, why would you do it on Instagram? You should do it on Facebook." Well, I want to build up the Instagram page. We added 700 people to an Instagram page in one day, actually in, in three hours. And the, the the match was watched by 1,200 people concurrently. I remember somebody's like, oh, it's a failure. Only 120 people watched it. I'm sorry. I have the stats. It was 1,200 at the end of the match. It hit top live. And, and you know, were there, were there bots in there? I don't know. I don't know anything about Instagram's sort of uh, bot culture, but it hit top live, and it, people cared about it. Again, 
All I care about is people cared. If nobody tuned in, then okay, we have to do something different. Uh, Josephus is actually somebody that worked with Billy and Resistance Pro. You know, he's a he was trained by Dutch Mantel uh, here in Nashville. I met him when I first moved to uh, to Nashville five years ago through Dutch. And, you know, he had worked for Resistance Pro. He had done some stuff at TNA. He had done a pay-per-view as Beauregard. He was actually a uh, Impact Grand Champion judge, if you go back to that uh, fine period, uh, for a little bit. And, you know, we needed an opponent for, for Tim at Crimson Show out here. And, you know, he lives he lives in Nashville. I went and shot the promo. It's one take. There's no edit. It's it, All we did was add music, which added a, a feel to it. And, again, I think this all goes back to making people feel things. And trust me, I wrote a lot of the promos that people uh, didn't feel anything at WWE. So if we can make you feel something about anybody, that's the, that's a win. So you you have the the Tommy Dreamer thing set up as well. NWA in the past has like it seems like every few years they're they're associated with a different promotion like ECW briefly, WWF, then TNA, then Ring of Honor, then New Japan. Is that something that you all are, are still willing to do? Because am I right in assuming that it's not as much a governing body as it is an entity, and right now a championship? But uh, is that something that you're open to doing? I know that Billy said that he's tried to have some conversations with Impact. Yeah, we've we've had uh, multiple conversations with Impact. We've had multiple conversations. There isn't a wrestling promotion minus New Japan. We haven't spoken to New Japan. Um I have a good relationship with the guys that do New, New Japan's TV because they're the guys who do Ring of Honor's television. But that's why Billy put out the open for business thing. Back to your challengers thing. So after the Tim match, people started to come out on the, out of the woodwork on Twitter on Sunday night. Uh, I want to challenge for the title. Like, like go look at the timeline of that. There were guys calling out Tim Storm before. We didn't put the tweet out until Monday night at like 6 o'clock Pacific because I was still in L.A. Then it really blew up. But, yeah, Janela was like the first one. Um, so – our ability to work with people is all based upon a handshake. We have a handshake with Tommy Dreamer. We set up a match in the future. It's now up to us and Tommy to make it work. You know, it's not like we're promoting a date. Yeah. It may happen. I don't know when it's going to happen, but that's the best part is anticipation. Right now, everything is so linear in wrestling, so linear. Like everybody knows that Jinder Mahal is going to fight uh, AJ Styles at the next pay-per-view. How do you know? Because that's, that is the predictive behavior of how WWE does it. Because guess what? They have to book house shows. They have a business model that requires that form of uh, lanes. We have no lanes. The fact that I can go uh, to Tommy Dreamer's house of hardcore, shoot three different sets of videos, meaning I shot it live on my phone. So that was broadcast live. I put the full segment up on YouTube different than the Facebook live one. We have a backstage interview that goes up. We'll have a documentary about it. The fact that that trip produced – Four different sets of content pieces plus set up potentially two different sets of matches, and there's and you don't know when. And I don't think that's a loss for people because they're interested. We're not and we're not asking for any money. We're just simply providing content, and we're going to do that in a lot of places. We have an invitation from CZW. Uh, Tim most likely will go to their show on December 9th. What happens there will be dependent upon what we all want to do, and that's the best part is. It's not laned. Oh, he's definitely going to go work with Janela. I don't know what we're going to do yet. We're going to talk about it, and it's going to be whatever's best for the fans. I think that's the part that also gets lost. You know, I think people worry about what's best for them. There's an audience of people that are dying for something different, and that's why, to me, wrestling fans have eroded. You know, I love, I love the um, overreaction culture of pro wrestling. There will always be something everybody overreacts to, but – the people that, that leave are not the ones that overreact. The, the people who leave are the ones who just go, you know what, this doesn't this doesn't satisfy me. If you go to a restaurant and they slap you in the face every time you go in there, you're going to go, you know what, I'm not coming in here anymore. So we're trying to create a product that you just – you want to come along with the ride, and it's more real. You know what I mean? Like where everything from the ropes out is real. I think that's sort of the feel of what we're trying to do. It's still wrestling. Once the guys get in the ring, it's still pro wrestling, and you will still have the normal tropes of pro wrestling, but they are real people. These are real people. Everybody's real, and everybody has flaws. It's like the opposite. At WWE, nobody has any flaws. It's just – it's weird. They, their characters don't have flaws. Uh, we are now seeing in, in, in the culture that basically everybody has flaws, and it's how you react to that story. And I think that that's almost an endearing thing, like – 
while I'm sure that Tim personally wishes that he wouldn't have gotten a little tired in that match, I, I think it almost tells a story that he said that he hasn't been. And in this match, maybe maybe it was the biggest challenge that he'd ever faced. Maybe this was that step up in competition that that could be portrayed down the line. But when I, I look at that, first off, I want to ask, are you all going to do more work with Dave Marquez? And yes. uh, I, I wondered yes. about that because it yeah, seems like so a pretty good platform. Well, and what's good about it is, and that's why we stream the match, the fact that now, like December 3rd, Tim will be on that show. Um, the fact that not only can I provide him content for his show, so again, helping him with his promotion, the fact that I could then stream segments from there live on that day to our audience, and then it's this this nice synergy of all that stuff. Yeah, so, so we'll be... For the near future, we will continue to provide uh, story and content to David, and vice versa. He will provide us the platform and location to do it. So what is the vision that you and Billy have? I, like, I, I hear about the 20-year plan. Is there anything that we can look for particularly in 2018? Obviously, it seems like you all are working on this documentary you mentioned. Yeah, so um, it's funny is, is because the, the 20-year plan is, is exactly that, but it's not like I can tell you you year 19 now but what we're trying to do is not uh like uber uber has never made money never yeah. it's not it's it's i mean uh ufc right now is not making money because they have to make giant payments on the on the debt they incurred they make money by obviously doing things right now our our plan is to brand build we're taking a brand that uh, before october 1st people felt a certain way about our job is to get as much attention as quickly as possible to build up as much goodwill and branding around this brand. Will we make mistakes? Yes. But we're also not – Billy's Billy said it. I got I have money to spend. But he's also not spending it just to spend it. You know, the budget that we're operating on, it's why we're not just running shows. If we ran a show, let's say we just picked a place. Let's say Tommy said, okay, you could run the arena the night before. Great. We ran an NWA show. It would just be a show. You know what I mean? Like we want to create a feeling around things you like. We're, we're making documentaries two or three times a week. The larger sort of NWA documentary will be something that maybe we put out as a special on a Netflix or provide to somebody. But the fact that we don't need to be behind any paywall and that content is available anywhere, like I'm sure we'll have a podcast. But I want our podcast to be completely different than the podcasts that are out there. I want them to be – Deeper dives. I, instead of just a conversation, it's a edited piece that also has a video component, meaning I go around and interview 10 NWA world champions and ask them their, their toughest match or what was it like the night they won the title or this or that. Like, I think there is a there's space. And, I, and here's the thing. I don't mind saying it publicly because I guess what? People aren't going to do it. Yeah. Most people in the wrestling business are super duper duper lazy. And I don't mind saying it because the people who aren't, the Young Bucks, Cody, Colt Cabana, they're out there doing it. Everybody else, hey, brother, book me for $500 and I'll uh, work for you. Cool. Appreciate it. That's great. You know what I mean? But the guys who are motivated to take control of this culture are winning, and we think we can create inside that. And those are the people we want to work with. Nick Aldis is hungry and wants to create a whole new future for not only the business but himself so that he hasn't doesn't have to be – uh, waiting around for a call from a major organization or from a contract that they will then tell him what to do. The fact that these guys can create and be part of a process is very exciting, and that's where Billy is really smart because he's an artist. I guess I'm technically an artist too now. You know what I mean? I guess I've always sort of been one, but you know what I mean as far as getting to create something and not having somebody tell me, no, that doesn't work. Well, can we try it? Can I try and see if it works? You know, Instead of just saying no, okay, let's try it because there's no downside. There really isn't. Like, like, uh, how many times have you seen people react? Oh, that guy character's dead. Yeah. Only for you know what I mean. It's it. it there, if you make constant mistakes, yes, your company goes out of business. Just look at WCW. But the booking isn't what really put it out of business. Yes, it it sure helped. But the 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 business issues of Time Warner also led to a lot of things and bad business decisions. Nobody had any range over the spending. That's why we're spending what we're spending and making right relationships and making you care. So, it's funny that you mentioned that with with Young Bucks and Cody and I have I, I always say there's like never th like two or three days that pass when somebody doesn't ask 
oh, how can I work full time in wrestling or wrestling media? And I was like, well, be prepared to not take any days off because it doesn't stop. Like you have to be willing to do that. And every trip I go on, I'm like, how can I get content out of this? How can I do this? How can I make this work? Young Bucks and Cody, I mean, they're they're constantly filming a YouTube series any time they are somewhere. Like, if they're at home, they're filming one. If they're at a, at a date, they're filming one. If they're backstage getting ready for a match, they're filming one. And I see that with the NWA now, too. It's like, you, you okay, you have a couple, you have a Josephus, Tim Storm match. All right, let's not just run the match. Let's get a promo out of it. Let's get yeah. content out of it. Let's maximize this and take a match that originally people probably weren't going to be interested in and make people interested in it. And it happened again with Josephus. Now, when that happens, are you, like, surprised or just like, this is working? I, I think it shows – and again, I, I just pulled up the numbers because uh, I'm curious myself. I mean, the Josephus interviews did – let's look and suck – I know 10,000 on YouTube at least. Yeah, 10,000 on YouTube. We, we did three promos. They did 20,000 views. Now, I don't. I, I wish YouTube would tell me exactly how many different people, but, you know, 20,000 views for a match, for an indie match at a show in Clarksville. And, again, let's say – let's say tw the, the analytics I got from Instagram said that 9,000 different people checked out the stream. Now, I don't, again, don't know if there are how many of those are wrestling fans, but those are those are eyeballs. Those are those are those are people interested enough. And the average view time on these promos pulled up was two and a half minutes. So, like, I have the ability. This is where television has failed, not only the 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 uh, consumer, but also the content creator. I have feedback. Okay, Josephus did ten thousand, did twenty thousand views in three days. Cold, no story, just. When we booked the match, the the promoter wanted to just announce the match cold. I'm like, there's no upside. I said, just announce Tim's there, and then when we get back I'll, from from L.A., we'll, we'll announce Tim will be there, and then we'll announce the challenger. And they were pushing. Well, we want to. I said, no one's going to care about Josephus until they care. So I went and shot one promo with Josephus. Then we did the phone call. Like the phone call, I was literally I, I hooked up my camera to uh, record the phone call. And I recorded it, and I edited it, and it was up an hour after I recorded it. And it was in canon, in storyline for this story. That's what's available. WWE won't do it because their process requires everything creative to go through Vince. They just won't. They just won't. TNA won't do it because they mass tape everything. Ring of Honor is the same way. No, but Ring of Honor utilizes a lot of the Young Bucks and Cody stuff. So there, I think, I think you can point to a lot of the – lift in ring of honors business to what what those guys are doing i don't have the analytics to prove that but i think when you look at what's happening you know i think those guys are are definitely helping push that company forward up the mountain um and why wouldn't i explore this everyone's like well are you guys gonna get on tv uh i'd love to be on tv but when you go on tv you enter deals with large conglomerates that have come with a lot of heavy expenses you know the the, the spike deal while great for tna is also what eventually killed it because the, the, you have to hit a number, and, you, and when you take somebody else's money, like I assume you work for somebody here at, at this website, right? You have to yes. answer to a boss. So I have to answer to Billy. So I have to create content that satisfy, satisfies the goal and the intention of what we're looking to do. We are already light years ahead of where we thought we'd be. And this is just me, just Billy, just Josephus, just Tim Storm, just Nick Aldis. You technically haven't ran an event yet. And already, go look at and, – and this is, again, no disrespect to any indie promoters. What we're doing, any of them can do. Now, granted, they don't have the NWA name. They don't have Billy and I. But they have the ability to do this with anybody. And by the way, uh, I have a degree in, in uh, television. I got that degree 20 years ago. I have not shot and edited in 18 years. I picked up a camera uh, last year in May. Because I'd, I'd seen a video of this guy, Gary Vonerchuk, who Billy and I met with in September of last year during the Impact stuff. Um, and he has a guy follow him with a camera. And that's where the Billy documentary came from. And we just went, this might work because what's the cost of a videographer now? It's nothing. It's a guy with a camera and a laptop. It's a content creator. It's just the skill in doing that. So I've, I've applied myself to learn it. And anybody says they can't learn it, it's, it's not that hard. Now, 
the creativity of it is hard, but you you can get better. But the Young Bucks were shooting their show on their iPhone, editing it in their iPhone. I think they recently, I think they showed it on the show, they switched over to a computer, and the show's obviously gotten better, but there is no reason. Kevin Steen was doing this five years ago. He was doing a YouTube show. This is not new stuff, but the ability to do it over and over and be repetitive to it has. As we wrap up, uh, a little bit out of left field, uh, what kind of relationship do you maintain with Dixie Carter, or do you anymore? Zero. Do you ever hear of her, like... Like I just never hear anybody say like if, if they keep in contact with her at all. I see her occasional tweet. Uh, they had a going away party for Rockstar Spud, uh, the week of Bound for Glory. They invited everybody uh, that worked with Spud except Billy Corgan and I, which is fine. She showed up. Um, I texted Spud, "Hey, sorry I wasn't at your party. Come to my house to watch Bound for Glory." Um, I had my last, you know, it, it was sort of. People were like, well, how come you didn't thank Dixie and John when you left? Well, one, I spoke to both personally. Uh, when I when I decided to quit, and it was my decision. Billy didn't say, hey, go quit. I made my own decision because I wanted – wrestling or not, I did not feel comfortable working in that company anymore after I saw the um, games and Game of Thrones, as Billy's called it, that happened in that company for over the four months that Billy paid everybody's salary. Mm-hmm. Paid everyone's salary. Dixie didn't pay their salary. She had run out of money and was pitting four different suitors against each other just to, again, keep herself afloat. I don't know what I would have done in that situation. I probably would have sold and taken the loss because I would have been the one that that created the situation. But I just decided to – I didn't want to move forward because I asked who my boss was, and nobody could tell me. So I made a decision. I spoke to John in person, shook his hand, thanked him for everything. Uh, Dixie called me and said, I'm so disappointed, and I said, so am I. And I appreciate – I do, and I appreciate the five years legitimately changed my life, just like Jeff Jarrett and Karen Jarrett changed my life by helping me get the opportunity. I appreciate all these people for for helping me get here, and I have nothing bad to say about them. But I have not spoken to Dixie since that phone call the day I quit, and I hope she does well. I, I don't know what she's doing, but I, I'm sure it's whatever she wants to be doing. Any of the uh, recently released or perhaps lapsed Impact wrestlers that you would be interested in? bringing in to do some NWA work? I'm interested in working with legitimately anybody that wants to do the work and do the work. This every, this is not a here's a contract, wait till we book you kind of company. Mm-hmm. So, for example, um, not that this person has been released, but DJZ and Ali, they're out making YouTube videos and, and creating stuff themselves because that's the culture. And if you're – it's it, it, it it doesn't infuriate me. It makes me sad that most people are still dealing with their wrestling bookings at 140 to 280 characters at a time. That's how they tell their story. And I love Twitter. I I, I I amassed my biggest following on Twitter years ago. And it's only good when you're engaging with where you're at. But when you're literally using it to just sell T-shirts all the time, there gets to be a point where you get tired of people uh, that way. So I, I want to work with anybody that wants to put in the work. Nick Aldis – I called him and said, here's what we're looking to do. I explained it to him. We talk every day. I just sent him the new video, and he, he's like, I like this video a lot, the one that's going to come out later today. And I said, yeah. I said, I struggled with it because it basically ends when the bell rings before their match. And the match has already happened. So I'd rather give a peek of something you haven't seen yet. So, like, I appreciate everyone's feedback. I appreciate your feedback. I was like, hey, what do you think of this? I think I DM'd you on one of them. I appreciate it because it helps me get better. And I have no issue of taking anyone's feedback. What's interesting in wrestling, it's like, well, wait till you see where the story goes. Cool. And and that's fine. But you have to be understanding that audiences will tell you stuff. Now, you have to kind of sift through it. Like the guy that hates Tim Storm. I mean, geez. I mean, this guy's. But here's the best part. I used to be that guy. I used to be that guy. I thought it was super suspicious. And you all found a way to turn it around. And I think there's a ton to be said about that because usually when somebody has their mind made up about a person in wrestling and I try to be as impartial and unbiased as possible, but I didn't find, I didn't know a situation where I would need to be unbiased towards Tim storm. When the hell was I ever going to talk about him before this? Well, and that's, that's the point. And that's, is Tim storm going to be world champion for 10 years? Probably not, but Tim's got a lot. I mean, there's a lot of, I think you could just sit there and think about four different stories for Tim from this point because you now know enough about him that that his story will think. I think Nick Aldis has got a lot of story to tell. 
I think everybody has a story to tell. You just have to want to tell it. I think I put that up today. It's like and, – and it, it was off something Galloway said when we were shooting the documentary. He's like, if you're not happy where you are, go where it makes you happy, something to that ilk. And you know, he, he did it. He got, he got let go from WWE. He, it was the worst day of his life, and then he said, I'm going to work. And he didn't stop working literally until my cameras – he drove off to go back to work at WWE. I'm not saying he wasn't working there, but you know, like – this, that's why I don't mind doing – I'll do every one of these interviews mm-hmm. because it's important that I – that's what we're not hiding any of our game plan. And we've been everyone, – everyone like October 1st, what are you guys going to do? We're doing exactly what we were doing all year. No one just paid attention. I would, like everything the, – these videos, we've been doing them all year. Nobody – just because it didn't have scoops with a Z and um, like it, it didn't have wrestling do it, we were, we were test marketing everything, everything. I tweet more about – technology and storytelling than i do wrestling sometimes because i'm trying to show everybody there's there's no secret sauce it's uh, cavemen this goes all the way back to cavemen and storytelling not flips and i love flips i love explosions but you got to care about the guy flipping or the explosion